Hello, this is Mr. White, and this video is on one-sided limits. You're going to find that they have some things in common with the two-sided limits we've been uh, doing lately, but there also are some distinctions that we'd better be aware of. So let's first take a look at the exercises I'm going to do in this video, uh, along with the times at which they appear in the video. But before we jump right into, into those, which are given in their, their algebraic form there, uh, you, we've probably already gone over the concept of one-sided limits in class just from a very conceptual and graphical perspective. So let's recap what that is before we tackle these exercises. All right, so here is a, a function f of x. And if we were to take the limit of f of x, as x approaches, it looks like the action's occurring at x equals 3, right? That's where this this break occurs here. So let's go ahead and say as x approaches 3, but let's put the little minus sign up here. And I'll remind you that how we say that out loud is we say that that is from the left. So the limit of f of x as x approaches 3, positive 3 from the left, equals what? Well, let's look at the picture. And as we approach coming from the left-hand side, as the x value is approaching positive 3, the y value is approaching positive 2, right? So that is our limit, our one-sided limit, with x approaching positive 3 from the left. Likewise, if I were to put the limit of f of x, and please do focus on how I'm saying this out loud and, and, and try to get it right um, so that when we are communicating in class, you can say it correctly. As x approaches positive 3, at this time we'll put the little plus sign up here and we'll say it out loud as from the right. Well, then we imagine a point approaching x equals positive 3 from the right-hand side. And we see that the y value is approaching negative 1, just visually. So we weren't worrying about equations and algebra. We're just looking at this conceptually and graphically. And we say that that lim one-sided limit is negative 1. So these are the one-sided limits. Uh, and we'll remind ourselves that if those two um, one-sided limits are different values, as they are here, then that means that there is no two-sided limit. If I just put x approaches 3 and I don't say from the left or from the right, well, in this case, I have to put DNE does not exist because the value coming from the left is not the same as the value coming from the right. And that automatically means that the two-sided limit does not exist. I'll remind you that DNE is an acceptable acronym. You may use it on my test. You may use it on the AP exam. It is understood to mean does not exist. Now, just to make sure we're clear, what if these two branches of this, uh, um, of this function just happened to uh, be the same? Oh, let me point one more thing out that I almost forgot. I want to remind you that it doesn't matter that this is open and that this is closed. That, remember, what happens at x equals 3 is totally irrelevant to the limits. Limits have to do with what happens as you approach x equals 3. It doesn't matter what, happen, what actually occurs at 3, whether you have a filled-in hole or, or an empty hole, etc. Okay? All right. Here's the point I was about to make before I interrupted myself. Um, if I move this up, let's say that this is what the function looks like. Do you see what would be different here? Well, the right coming from the right, we would now be approaching to as well um, as coming from the left. And then, since you have the same value coming from the right and from the left, then the two-sided limit would also be that same value. Okay? So that is the concept that we've, maybe I've t told you nothing new in the video so far. If you remember all of that, excellent. Let's go ahead and look at these exercises now. So here we don't have the benefit of um, a picture drawn for us. And guess what? I'm going to add another restriction here. We're going to do this without a calculator. If this was not a low-budget operation, I'd have the, the music come in and go dun-dun-dun without a calculator. Uh, so let's look at that first one. All right. Um, 
This one, if you feel like you know what to do, there's a good chance that you do. We're going to approach it very similarly to how we've uh, approached um, the two-sided limit. So we're going to start by just kind of disregarding that 4 minus. Um, and we're going to start with what we normally do. We let, let's try to just um, direct substitute a positive 4. So, so I really emphasize this is not negative 4. This is positive 4 approaching from the right. But again, let's ignore that from the right and just plug in a positive 4 here. And we see that, indeed, we do get the 0 over 0 indeterminate form case. So we're not done. We've got to back up and, and try something different. But remember, direct substitution should be your first resort right off the bat. Once in a while, it'll actually work. OK, so what do we do since we got indeterminate form? Hopefully, you're recalling. We'll do the exact same thing that we do with, um, with the two-sided limits. We multiply by root x plus 2. And if I do it on top, i got to do the same thing on the bottom. So I'm going to go through this a little bit more quickly. Uh, we, we've done this before, but I'll, I'll refresh your memory here, that we do tend to distribute out numerators in calculus. We're going to find that very often that, that's good because it, um, we get like terms and we can combine them and cancel things out, whereas the denominators we tend to leave in their factored form. So if, you don't, if you're not totally buying that argument yet, I just ask that you keep your eyes open and you'll notice that that, you know, that, that tends to benefit us. Uh, let me go ahead and just write out x minus 4. That's what I get when I FOIL out the top. Um, some students might want to put root x squared, but I remind you, that's just x, right? So x minus 4. And now I see the benefit of, of putting that, that root x plus 2 over root x plus 2 in. I see that now that, that that factor up top, that x minus 4, is the same as what I've got down below here. So I'm definitely going to keep that bottom factored because I'm looking a step ahead and seeing that I can cancel something out here in just a moment. Now, are you noticing I'm leaving a little space there? I, I hope you remember why. Because this is non-negotiable. Put the limit every time as applicable. All right. So now I see that the x minus 4 up top cancels out or divides out the x minus 4 on the bottom. I'll remind you that graphically what that is like is if you had a function with a hole in it in indeterminate form, as soon as you cross that, that troublemaking factor out, that effectively plugs in the hole, right? And that's going to allow us to direct substitute in the next step. So let's go ahead and do that now. Now I'll direct substitute. And since I'm direct substituting, um, now I'll get rid of the limb uh, notation. I'm going to put the one that I now have up top. Again, there's a one up here left over when I crossed out the x minus 4. And down below, I've got square root of 4 plus 2. So since I've direct substituted, I don't have to write limb anymore. And I see that that just gives me 1 over 2 plus 2, which is 4. And guess what? That is not only our two-sided limit, but it's also our one-sided limit. So I remind you, the fact that this works as a two-sided limit means that, that the y value is approaching one-fourth from the left and from the right. So that, that minus sign never really is something we had to be totally uh, paying attention to in this particular exercise. Uh, what does that all look like graphically? Well, if I had graphed that original function, root x minus 2 over x minus 4, I would have gotten something that looks like that. And I have the calculator window settings such that it does show that little hole. But remember, we shouldn't rely on our calculator to show us that. We should intelligently and analytically know that it's there. I'll go ahead and point out that this is basically half of a sideways parabola with a hole in it, of course. But again, I really want to emphasize that we can see visually here, too, that as we approach from the left, we're getting the same y value that we would get if we approach from the right. And in either case, for that x value of positive 4, the y value turned out to be 1 fourth. That's where the hole is. All right, so not too much different in this particular example um, from two-sided limits. The, the approaching from the left, from the right, didn't make a big difference. Let's look at one where there is a difference. And we need to take a, a little different approach. We don't really have any clever algebraic tricks here for plugging in holes or anything. We have to tackle this one a different way. Um, root x minus 2 over just x minus 2. Um, this is one where you're best off just kind of thinking, hmm, I, I don't know what that looks like. Let me just plug in some numbers. 
We can tell that we're interested in what happens around x equals 2, and in this case we are approaching from the right. But let's start by just trying to think graphically what does this look like. So how do you know when to tackle it algebraically versus graphically? That'll come with experience, and you've got to be willing to just try either approach. So graphically slash numerically, because, um, because I'm going to go say let's just plug in some numbers now. Um, if I try to plug in x equals 2, I see that I'll get indeterminate form. So nothing's going on at x equals 2. Um, what about at x equals 3? Well, if I put a 3 here and a 3 here, I get absolute value of 1 over 1. And that gives me just a y value of 1, right? So at 3, 1, and I'll go ahead and put some numbers on here. This is 3, this is 1. Um, I've got a point. What if I had plugged in 4? Well, I get absolute value of 2 over 2. And that would give me, again, a y value of just 1. And what about 5? You see where this is going. Whether I plug in 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, I'm going to keep on getting y values of 1. And I realize that, OK, I can just draw a line here, or at least a ray, I guess I should call it. Um, let's plug in some more values. 2 is where, where things started to get a little bit weird. So let's, let's try plugging in 1. Let's go to the left of 2 now. Let's plug in a 1. And I see that I get absolute value. I'm going to go ahead and write it out here. Absolute value of negative 1 over 1. Um, normally, I wouldn't insist that you write this out. But just for those who are a little more visual, let's see what's going on here. Um, oh, I'm sorry. That's over negative 1, right? And the absolute values make the top positive but the bottom's still negative. So you see that my y value is actually negative 1 now? So again, that's something I'd normally just do mentally, but write it out if you feel the need to. Um, so at x equals positive 1, I've now got a y value of negative 1, not positive 1. And if I had plugged in x equals 0, I would have gotten an absolute value of negative 2 over negative 2, and that once again would have yielded a negative 1. And same if I had plugged in x equals negative 1 or x equals negative 2, and I sense that I'm getting a, a ray that goes in this direction. Now, if we look a little more closely at what's really happening around 2, I can deduce that if I plug in numbers that are really close to 2, whether it be 2.01 or 1.99, I can pre pretty quickly deduce that this will go all the way up to 2 and have a, a hole there. And this branch will go all the way up to 2 and have a hole there. Nothing, again, nothing really happens at x equals 2. But I see now what's happening as I approach 2. And now we see that that plus sign, that x approaches 2 from the right, now we see that that is relevant here. Because that's what tells me to follow this branch coming from the right. And I see that not only is the y value approaching 1, it's actually equal to 1 along the stretch doesn't matter that there's a hole once I reach this x value. Remember, that's irrelevant. As I approach it, the y value is 1. And therefore, we will say the limit is positive 1. Box around it, call it done. Now, just to just extend this a little bit, what if this had been x approaches 2 from the left? Well, in that case, I would have been looking along this branch, right? And I would have said the limit was negative 1. OK? Hope that all made sense. Again, this was different from the first example, because we really had to approach it in a different way, more numerically and graphically than algebraically. And, and don't be afraid of that. Embrace it. Practice all, all the different ways of looking at a, a function, algebraic, graphical, numerical. All right, our last one, the dreaded piecewise function. Students. Always uh, groan and moan about piecewise function, but I'd say the sooner you can become comfortable with them, boy, the better off you're going to be. Um, all right. Um, students are more inclined to approach this numerically, to, to start plugging in numbers, kind of like we did in the last example. And if you want to do that, I'm not mad at you. Um, obviously, you can tell here that you're going to plug in numbers around x equals 2. That's what we're most concerned with. So. Um, you can plug in numbers. That's fine. I'm going to choose a, a different approach. I'm going to do this algebraically. And again, the really diligent student will be comfortable doing it either way. 
I'm going to um, take this first one. Let's just really focus on that. And let, let's uh, rewrite that quadratic in uh, vertex form. Now, if you don't remember exactly what that is from pre-calc, again, I'm hoping that as I go through it, you'll go, oh, yeah, I kind of remember that. It's, it's sort of like completing the square. I write the, the quadratic in linear terms, the x squared minus 4x, and then I ask, what do I need to add to this to make this a perfect square? Trinomial. Well, this would make it a perfect square trinomial. Now, I didn't really want plus 4. I wanted plus 6. So let me go ahead and add a 2 there. And that makes this whole expression equal to the original one, right? Now, if, I, if you didn't totally remember why I put the plus 4, here's why. It's because now I can take this perfect square trinomial and write it as x minus 2 times x minus 2 or x minus 2 quantity squared. The plus 2 is still just hanging out. And if you're wondering why would I go through the effort to do all that, it's because now I can look at that and say, I know that that is a quadratic, that is a basic parabola that has been translated 2 to the right and then 2 up, using our pre-calc transformation knowledge. So I'm going to draw a very crude sketch. And if, um, depending on what the task is, there's some times where I would take a little more care in developing the sketch. But this one I'm going to do just as much as I feel is necessary. And I'm going to be efficient here. Um, I know that I'm interested in x values around 2. So I'll go ahead and put the 2 there. Um, I'm going to assume for the moment that my y values aren't terribly big and be willing to adjust if necessary. And I'm looking at this parabola here. And I'm saying, again, that this is a basic parabola, and it is being translated to the right, 1, 2, and then up, 1, 2. OK? Now, what about this whole thing? We don't really want the whole parabola. We only want the x values that are less than 2. So even though I might start by sketching out the whole parabola, as I did just here, I'm going to now recognize that I only want the values that, um, that are less than 2. So here's the x value of 2. I'm putting a hole there because I, I want x to be less than 2, not less than or equal. And this is the stretch of the parabola that I really want. All the rest of it to the right of 2, I don't want because, because of this inequality statement. OK, so let me get rid of the rest of it. Put it over here. And um, let me get my color coding consistent. Let me make this blue. and. Uh, make this uh, blue as well. And I'll go ahead and analyze the other statement now. Let's figure out what the rest of this, of this graph looks like. Again, I'm going to go through this a little bit quickly. I'm trusting that you're recalling some of our pre-calc, but if you don't, I hope you'll contact me. Um, again, you can just plug in several x values and kind of get a sense of what the shape is. Um, I'm, I'm OK if you do that, but um, I'm going to do it the, the cool kid way. I'm going to take that negative out front, and I'm going to say, to complete the square, I need an x squared. Now, now, since I have that negative outside the parentheses, I need to take that plus 4x and make it minus 4x. And to complete the square, it'll be plus 4 again. Close parentheses. If I'm mentally distributing that negative sign, I'll have, I now have negative x squared plus 4x minus 4, right? So I need to do a plus 2 to get me back to, to this to this uh, uh, expression. So again, this is now equivalent to this part of the curve. And now I'll rewrite it in the vertex form. And I see that this is a graph that has been flipped across the x-axis, reflected across the x-axis, translated 2 to the right, and moved up. OK? So let's. Um, Take this graph that has been flipped across the x-axis, this basic parabola curve, and okay, let's uh, uh, translate this 2 to the right, and then 2 up. We're seeing where some of our pre-calc practice helped us out. And now I'll say, OK, I don't really want all of that parabola, right? I only want where x is greater than or equal to 2. So that tells me I actually do want this point. I'll fill this in. And notice that that plugs up the hole on the other graph. And I want the x values that are greater than 2. I don't want anything to the left of that. I just want those x values. So now I can get rid of, the, of that. 
And this is what my graph looks like. This is what my piecewise function looks like. Let me uh, clear this off. And I see that it is a continuous graph here. I didn't have any breaks after all. Now, let's look at the limit. So what does this mean as far as the limit of this graph, f of x? And again, it, didn't look, it wasn't even a one-sided limit. It's just x approaches 2. But I can say that it doesn't matter whether I approach from the left or from the right. In both cases, the y value was 2, correct? So let's go ahead and put that. Equals 2, and we are done. Now again, just extending the concept, how would this have been different? Um, let's say if this, instead of being plus 6 up here, let's say that had been plus 7. Let's say that that graph had been moved up one more unit. That means that the graph graphically would have looked like that, right? And now it does matter whether I come from the left, I'm getting one value. When I come from the right, I'm getting another value. So in that case, if that had been the equation, I would have put D and E. Okay? Or if I had, um, let's say we had made this a one-sided limit. So let's say I had done from the left there, x approaches 2 from the left. That would mean that, once again, I'm approaching from the left, and I see now that my y value is approaching positive 3 as I come along this branch. So in that case, I would have said, positive three. Okay, hope that all made sense, and of course, if not, please contact me.